Welcome to another episode of Behind the Billboard. As you know, we are the podcast that get behind some of the greatest billboards of all time and with some of the most amazing people. And today we have another one of those amazing people. We have Graham Fink. Graham Fink. I mean, I, I don't know. We've been waiting a long time for this long one, Long time. We? He's up there with Heg, I think, for the big dogs. Yeah, so um, I, this is definitely going to be a two-parter for us because yeah. we've got, I mean, we've been through this work and we've, you know, we had a, we had a pre-meet, you and I, as we always do. Yes. And there is 50-odd slides of work to go through in this deck. So and, we've, and we've had to take out things like, he wrote the great, the BA face ad, which is one of the 100 greatest ads of all time. We've taken out some of the greatest ads of all time to get to the greater ads of all time. Yeah, the greater billboards. So a few think facts. Oh, here we go. This is yeah. a new one. Sorry, yeah, this is actually kudos Adam Buxton. This is how he does his song. Adam, obviously you're, think you're, facts. you're going to be listening uh, how we're ripping off your thing. But think, we, it doesn't have like a little jingle or something? Think facts, yeah. Well, we can create our own audio mnemonic for this bit, couldn't we? Should I just f- try and find something? What's the last thing playing on my phone? Think facts. <laughs> Anyway, Graham Fink, uh, he is a multimedia artist. Um, he is one of the world's most awarded creatives. He won China's first ever Cannes Grand Prix with Coca-Cola Hands. Like I said, he, he made uh, the British Airways Face commercial, uh, listed as one of the 100 greatest ads of all time. Um, he works in fashion, film, photography, drawing, painting, technology. He is an agent to uh, an Android robot called Sophia. I mean, the guy... She's a humanoid. She's a humanoid. Sorry, what's it? Android. Sorry, mate. I've gone all a bit. It's humanoid Android. Um, he was the youngest ever president of DNA D. He runs Fink Tank. Uh, it, it just Fink different. It, there's so many things about him which are fascinating. We're going to just, like, reduce him just to billboards on our show. But I think that'll be all right. Well, we could do a whole series on yeah. Mr. Fink. Yeah. But I think at the beginning we'll ask him what he's up to and, you know, hopefully you can give us a little bit of... You think? Oh, God, he started right. Who's going to get him? You or me? You. Okay, thanks, mate. Have you got the little fob? Thanks, mate. Sorry. (laughs) Oh, God. Graham Fink, welcome to Behind the Billboard. Good morning. Fantastic to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, It feels long overdue, to be honest. You've got a huge amount of uh, billboard, outdoor work, posters, etc. you've done over the years. So we're extremely um, pleased and honoured you're here today. Um... So, yeah, thank you. We wanted to ask, first of all, how are you and what are you up to at the moment? What's Mr. Fink doing at the moment? Okay. Well, I don't think I have COVID. <laughs> Good news. So far, I seem to have managed to avoid it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm pretty busy. I've got a lot of projects on at the moment. And um, I wrote a course for creativity last year, for creativity for business, which you may have seen called Think Different. Yes. And um, and I ran that uh, with my friend David Hyatt down at, oh, uh, at the Doolet. The Howie's guy. David's great. I mean, David, I, you know, I trained David at um, at Saatchi's. He was yeah. in my group when I worked with, right. with Jeremy Clark. He worked with um, Ajab Singh. Yeah, yeah. I know. And then David left and set, and set up... Um, Howie's, yes, you probably know, yeah, and then yeah. um, that did well, too well. Yeah, and, they sold uh, them, didn't they? To uh, yeah, I think it just, it, it, you know, I think he was very young and he thought it's fantastic. We're growing, we're growing a thousand percent a week. Amazing. <laughs> didn't then, they have a great end line like the third biggest business in Cardigan Bay or something? Oh, okay, it's great. I always remember that. It's really funny. <laughs> I like the idea they make jeans in Cardigan. Yeah, but anyway, he he eventually sold that, and then they set up a new version of it, Hyatt. Hyatt Jeans, and um, and also in conjunction to that, he does this thing called the Do Lectures when he mm-hmm. puts up his, I think, 50 wigwams or something each year and right. um, and rents those out and has incredible speakers like Sir Tim Berners-Lee and and um, you go there for two or three days. It's it's fantastic. Wow. And, um, and obviously in 2020, he couldn't do it. <clears throat> so he did an online, uh, there was an online course that a friend of his did, Duke Stump. Right. He's like one of the world's top CEOs. And then David said to me, why don't you do a course on creativity? And I thought, actually, that's probably a little bit too vague. It should be creativity for business. Mm. And it's aimed, I don't want it aimed specifically at advertising people. It should be any business because I think creativity should be at the heart of every business you know, yeah. to to, um, to stand out, to stand for something. And uh, it's amazing how many CEOs I talked to and you talked about what's your point of view, what's your manifesto, what, what's your point of difference. And they go, 
what do you mean? <laughs> I just and you talk to him and they go, that's fantastic. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So um, it was great. And TikTok sent uh, 38 people to the course. Wow, they right. thought it was fantastic. And EY sent 15 people. Yeah, so it, it was fantastic. So I want to do it again this year. And I'm talking to some other companies about doing bespoke versions with them. Yes. Um, I do little projects occasionally um, with advertising agencies and design companies when they need ideas. Um, I'm doing lots of art. I've got an exhibition coming up in in March, um, which I'm working on. Is this your paintings? <coughs> paintings by the sea. It, <coughs> this is photography. The, the, oh. um, <coughs> excuse me. The, um, the 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 one in March is is a series of photographs. But then I want to do. I've been doing these postcards in lockdown. Um, because I'm in a very small okay. studio and I started painting postcard size portraits every morning uh -huh. um, on this sort of metallic foil. And the reason I use metallic foil is painting watercolor on metallic foil doesn't work at all. And I thought, this is great. No one else will be doing this. <laughs> so I eventually worked out a way to make it work. And, um, and I was painting three or four or five before breakfast every day and it got to a point I thought my god I've got 200 then it went 500 and I've now oh, wow. over, I've now got over a thousand of them Jeez. I mean most of them are rubbish but um, I'm sure I can find some good ones <laughs> you'd turn them into NFTs and yeah but although I think NFTs are better when they're kind of moving things I have an idea for a for an NFT thing um you know watch watch this space um and yeah so tons of stuff and then I decided to try and read train myself into learning classical guitar because I played a little bit when I was a kid and I haven't played for, well, since I got went to art school. Right. Um, and that is really, really difficult, um, incredibly frustrating and, and really, really hard. But <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's good for the brain and hopefully it will keep the Alzheimer's away. Yeah, I read, I mean, I'll come on to it, but I remember saying something about you tr trying to start drawing with your left hand. Yes. Because your right hand was... An expert. An expert. And I love I love that um, ethos about pushing yourself and, you know, going out of comfort zones. Is that something that you've always had? Is it, It's not just something you've adopted. You've, you've always been like that as a person? I think, I don't know, it's interesting, isn't it, nature or nurture? Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting. And, you know, the think different thing, obviously the, it's a play on the apple, think different. But my mum used to say when we were really small, us thinks, you know, we're different. <laughs> And um, and I think, you know, my mum was very creative and, and my dad is creative. He's now painting. He discovered painting literally five years ago. He's like 86. Yeah, he's the, the master forger. He's the master forger so on that, Instagram. I, I was, at the time when I started following him, I thought this is a cruel joke, right? Graham's pretended to be his dad and now, and it's not, is it? It's really your dad no. and he's brilliant. It's he's great. Amazing. Well, I mean, my mum died about five years ago and I wanted him to... You know, he, he's he's a, he's a butler and he trains butlers. Um, but I thought he really needs, you know, something else because he's not going to be able to do this forever. Right. And I met um, an art teacher who, funnily enough, used to teach philosophy. These philosophy classes I used to go to. And I said to him, Jeffrey, would you give my dad some painting lessons? Right. And he said, why? Is your dad an artist? I said, no. I, don't. I said, he hasn't <laughs> painted. I said, I think he used to go to some art classes, evening classes, I said, when I was about five years of age, but I've never seen him pick up a brush since. Right. So they started, and after about six weeks, Jeffrey calls me up and says, your dad, he's actually, he's like a natural, he's really, really yeah. good. So he's, he's you know, progressed phenomenally well. And um, yeah, amazing stuff. And now he's forging the, yeah. the great masters. That <laughs> I've got this idea, you know, actually there's a short film in here that it's, it's a butler who kind of forges all the real <laughs> paintings in the house and <laughs> secretly keeps uh, yeah, that's an, replacing that, them. It's kind of like one of those tales of the unexpected. Yeah. I wonder whether we should get your dad on. <laughs> <laughs> He'd love it. Um, you probably need three hours. So you can yeah, okay, we can do a two-part. Before, just before we get into some billboards, can you tell us a little bit about Sophia the robot? Yes. So um, I was, I got a call. It was when I was leaving Ovi in, in China from um, David Hansen at Hansen Robotics. And I went to see them and they were interested in working with me to help them 
with branding Sophia? You know, what brand should she be working with? They said, you know, we often get calls from agencies and we, they send scripts and mm-hmm. they said, yeah, something you could really help us with. Um, and what should she say? And all that kind of stuff. So I, it sort of turns out that I'm Sophia's agent, and uh, which I think is just really cool. Brilliant. Kind of like I, I should wear <laughs> dark glasses, a bit sort of men in black kind of thing. Yeah. Does that um, mean that she takes on some of your personality? Given that? no, not yeah. I don't think she, she, she <laughs> really shouldn't. But I've I've met oh, her. I assume her. she learns off everyone that she, she spends time with. She's right? learning. Yeah. yeah. So I've met her a few times and I did an interview with her. Um, and obviously she's very, very smart, much smarter than me. And um, she's fascinating to to talk to. And there's different modes mm. you can talk, talk to her, her in. So I'm doing that. And I'm also been, I just went to visit Ada. So Ada is the world's first uh, humanoid artist robot. Oh, yeah. And she was, she did some, some watercolors and I, I've just, bought a couple and I went to meet her right. um, a few days ago to pick them up. Now she's extraordinary. Um, she's painting. I mean, she physically paints oil paints with wow. hands and she's doing sculpture. Jeez. And I just really like this whole idea that all this stuff is, is you know, it, it's really challenging our sort of preconceptions of what art is and can a robot be creative and all this kind of stuff. And it it's kind of quite fun to wind up my copywriter friends and saying, well, you know, these, these robots are on your case. You know, they're right. Yeah. It's they're the right same for lawyers and accountants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, there was, a, there was an AI um, that wrote, uh, they, they fed this particular AI all the um, Harry Potter books and this robot or uh, this AI produced a new Harry Potter book, the next one in the series, in 20 minutes. Oh, my God. Wow. And his friend of mine's got, got it and he says, yeah, he said, I wouldn't recommend it. He said, it's not that <laughs> great. But the, he said it is really interesting. And the thing is, that's kind of like first attempt. So yeah, first yeah. I've only been doing this like five minutes. Imagine what it's going to be like in another yeah. five years. Time. A friend of mine, um, I think I've mentioned him on the show before, Duncan Wardle's on the same uh, speaking circuit as Sophia and he, he he hates it when he's on with her because <laughs> she gets top billing and he's a, <laughs> and also Duncan Wardle's on as well talking about creativity. So yeah. No, it's it's great. It's just interesting to be in that world and, and you know, just keep learning. Mm. Can I ask you a quick question before we move on? Isn't that, you know, you have so many hats you do wear. Mm. You know, you're often described as, you know, a multimedia artist and a painter and ad guy, <laughs> author, you know, it's fascinating. But is there one hat you prefer to wear or feel skin you're more comfortable in or is it lovely being having all these different roles you know what i mean is there one you go no i like all the different roles i mean it's very difficult when people ask you what you do and you know it's that thing about jack of all trades master of none which i think is the the world's worst sentence ever written i think it's a very shaming sentence Mm. i think it's destroyed a lot of um Mm. sort of people's aspirations and um I think it's a real setback, that thing. I mean, the human mind is just incredible. You think what we, we can do and what we can comprehend and what we can come up with. And I think the, the you know, the human mind is is not limited, it's limitless. Yeah. And, you know, all this idea about specialising in in one thing as we go into school, it starts off lots of topics and then you've got to start sort of narrowing it down. Yeah. Um, I think it's all our education system needs re-looking at and re booting mm, yeah. and um you know I, 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 are we gonna i suppose we'll talk about billboards one day but, um, <laughs> yeah we better move on but it someone was telling me the other day that there was a, a guy who showed um two pictures of a, of a hospital one like a hundred years ago and a hospital now and the difference is absolutely huge the first one you really it would really put you off your food yeah um, right. it's like disgusting and horrible and they don't really understand germs and all that kind of stuff like the dude and and you look at a modern operating theater and it's just pure science fiction and it's mm. so clean mm. and yeah. if you do the same thing with a classroom <laughs> yeah yeah and you took a classroom from like 100 years 200 years ago um and and now it's exactly the same yeah you've got someone standing at the front and all the te- all the kids you know yeah standing in, in or sitting in rows behind and it just I think it's really quite depressing. My brother's a school teacher up in um, in Bedford, right. and you know he tells me a lot of horror stories about how they teach art on PowerPoint. And, yeah, and he sort of they in this oh, God, art. Don't. And, um, don't. Uh, we've been we've been looking around schools recently, and there's 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 one in particular that's kind of a, a bit more challenging school, um, which is challenging the status quo for education. They've changed. 
the classroom dynamics. They've changed how the children see it. They've changed, you know, as much as they can against the, the kind of the, the structure and rigor that the education system forces on kids. Mm. And it's really interesting to see the output. You know, the, the the work on the walls is vastly different to the stuff that you see at the other schools. It's just incredible. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I have to say, I'm a victim of. I'm, I'm, I'm a perfect. <coughs> my daughter is doing A level art, and seriously, the house just gets taken. It's swamped by the stuff. So I did a bit of a tidy up. So look, that's where your stuff is. This uh, is your paint. She goes, Dad, how do you expect me to be an artist if you just keep tidying everything up? <laughs> and it was fair like, enough. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair enough. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll get you a studio, darling. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Go on. Go for it, Dan. The, the billboard at the end of my street. It's a relatively new segment that we've got. But <clears throat> before we get into your one, which I think was a, a post that we're going to... We've got one that I think a friend of yours sent over to you and you, you forwarded it on to us, which was for Spitfire. <laughs> um, it, I mean, there are more words in this than some of my, my <laughs> kids' books that they read. <laughs> but yeah, let's, let's talk about Spitfire. Not too long. Okay. <laughs> So Spitfire, so, um, I, you know, Paul Burke is a good friend of mine and I think he writes some great stuff and he's, and, you know, he absolutely loves posters, um, as I do. I mean, I think actually posters is my favorite medium of, of all of them. I, I love working on the thing. Right. And, um, we were talking about the worst poster <laughs> we've ever seen and we were swapping <laughs> things and this one came up, it's, um, I don't even know what it's for. It says oh, I struggled. at the top. Is it insurance or banking? Oh, telecoms. And telecoms and IP, IP engineering, engineering solutions for business since 1988. Oh, there's a date thing there as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this thing is, uh, if I can describe, it's it's kind of... Um, yeah, try and describe, describe it. it. So it's, a, it's a picture of a, of a swordfish, yeah. um, which is kind of takes up, probably a, a quarter of a poster and it's on the left hand side and not and forgetting the name of this company is spitfire yeah so there's a swordfish yeah it's a, oh, it's a sword blue marlin it's a blue marlin oh yeah okay that would that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and at the top it says probably the biggest thing it says spitfire and i don't know if that's a logo and then and that's in a gray band across the top and then there's a spit then there's a swordfish underneath and the line next to that is snappy line says, does your cloud solution need high speed, reliable access? Whatever your budget, Spitfire have an Ethernet solution to suit your business needs from £99 a month. And underneath there is a another band with the, the <laughs> website on it and uh, some other stuff I can't even it's read. It's nearly the end of the episode, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <it's> <laughs> and then in the top right, it hasn't finished, folks. It's uh, <laughs> telecoms and IP engineering solutions for business since 1988. And there's a whole bunch of really, really tiny Small yeah, print, read. probably I'll read, I'll read it words out. I've got it here. Around, uh, to the left oh, of the... Oh, do you know what it I've says? got it here. It says, the blue marlin can reach speeds of 60 miles an hour thanks to its 24 vertebrae, which allow for rapid movement through the water, making it one of the fastest fish in the ocean. So surely they could have just said, we're the blue marlin of <laughs> IP engineering, at least. <laughs> <laughs> I... I... Anyway, I think what if anyone should... knows who's done this, so let, 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 you kill know, them. You should interview them. <laughs> yeah, we, I was thinking actually, we should, when we do the best of the year, we should definitely have the worst because um, Justin Tindall was on the other week and he I brought was, something yeah. in which was appalling. And and just to be clear, this is a forty-eight sheet poster, <laughs> so this is on a roadside with at least a hundred words on, which is incredible. Okay, so should we move on from this? Because it, it is pretty... It is, it's making my eyes hurt. But we should talk about the one that is sort of at the end of your street, which you sent it us. Um, shall I... Can you remember it, right? Yeah. Have you got it there? Because it's not at the end of the street, but it's the bus, bus stop nearest your house. And it's a, that's a digital screen on the bus stop, isn't it? Yes, it's a digital screen. Um, do you want to describe it? Yeah, I could describe it. It's the COVID... So stop COVID-19 hanging around and it's those ones where there's this sort of looks like soot has just been sprayed across the picture. And the line says, COVID is still highly infectious, open windows to disperse the virus particles. Oh, it's so bad. Yeah, there's three, uh, three people lads. of colour and they're kind of like punching the air, excited. I guess they're sort of playing yeah. Games or something. Playing games or watching football or something, are they? Yeah, it's yeah, just... but you don't see what, what they're, they're doing. doing. It's really, it's I, I find it really confusing. And um, but it's a headline because it's so tiny, you you can't read it. I had to get up really close to see this. Um, 
yeah, and then stop COVID-19 hanging around. I mean, it's really not going to have any effect at all. No. Um, so just with that in mind... <laughs> Um, let's talk about some good stuff. <laughs> well, let's just before we move on, what what kind of state do you think the out of home industry is in? Given that we've just looked at two awful pieces of work, um, as you, as you walk around and as you're going around your with your many hats on, what what kind of state would you say are the industry is in? I think it's pretty sick, um, and it's 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 a real shame. I mean, I love posters and mm. I want to see great stuff up there and um and i think it really i mean it's, it's it's you know i guess it's easy to say well it's always it's never a vintage year this year is it and you, you look back mm. at the great posters but i really think it's it's pretty tragic and uh, it does, and it seems i'm not the only one to, to say this and so when you do see something half good you think oh that's, yeah that's good it really stands out doesn't it yeah yeah and uh, I mean, we've we've mentioned this before, but that you know, in comparison to some of the work we're going to look through now, in terms of an age, there's far more canvas available to people now in the out of home space. Out of home has boomed. Yeah. While they've taken down lots of the print sites, lots of these digital sites have popped up. So, is the canvas too big for creatives to deal with? Is it uh, is it the fact that I mean, we talked about the disposability of digital. Is what what's what's cheapened it? What's made it? What's mm. made people have less effort towards their out of home? Do you think? I don't know. I mean, it's easy to say clients, but it's not clients. It, it, oh, they take some of the responsibility, but I think you know agencies have to take responsibility too, because it's obviously not being great stuff isn't being produced or it's not getting through and if mm. it's not getting through then you know why can't they get it sell it through you know there's ways of doing that um i know there's lots of layers but you would think because there's more kind of ways of getting your messages out um that it actually should be getting better yeah um, so I don't know. I'm, I mean, you know, where where's all the young, interesting kids coming out of art college that are going, we're going to change the world and do stuff? I'm not sure. Or whether it's kind of fear and everybody's yeah. terrified of, you know, saying the wrong thing mm. um, and sticking their neck out and being a bit provocative, you know, because nobody, you can't upset anyone. Um, yeah. I don't know. But maybe, and maybe it's a mixture of all those things. And so the stuff that does stand out, you know, have you seen stuff recently that you you feel has stood out? And- well, I saw. You know, when that when they had the you know the the um, the Facebook Instagram thing all went down last year for what is it forty eight hours yeah. or something. I just I saw this the next day. It was a, it's a billboard for the uh, post office, and it just says social post, and they crossed out the word social. And um, I thought actually that's great. You know, mm. it's. If, you know, there's a lot of energy there. Someone someone thought of it. They came up with it. They, they got it through. They mm. ran it. It appeared, it, you know, it didn't appear a week later. It appeared mm. like the next day. And I thought it was really fresh and fantastic. I wish there was more of this kind of... Yeah. And, you know, that's. I think, you know, I just mentioned that the, the, the canvas has changed somewhat over the last 10, 15 years. And the digitization is helping some of that relevancy, the time-sensitive stuff, happen. There's been some great stuff for spec savers. When, when someone read out the wrong, um, Oscar. Uh, wrong Oscar nomination or Oscar winner, <laughs> yeah. the next day it should have gone to spec savers. You know, and so the, that stuff, the the kind of instantly changeable thing, where you can, like you said, get the idea out, get it in front of a client, get it worked up, and get it sent out and onto a highly visible billboard. Yeah, is phenomenal. That I mean, that is a very good use of digital. Isn't mm. it? You know, because you can get it out there dead quickly there's the burger one we we had a while back then the burger yeah. king when it was um th- there was a whole load of stuff going on at whitehall and uh, it just said another another whopper <laughs> another big whopper on the side of a bus wasn't it mm. and um, you kind of think those are now getting traction but there is a big there's a big void in you know like you have a 10 second or 20 second digital ad what do you do do people put a version of the tv ad on there do you create something completely for bespoke or do you use some part social post i mean i've been involved in i've been working at the bbc for nearly a year just finished and a lot of stuff gets 
crunch down and reversion from another format yeah and you go well can we not do something original and you go yeah, yeah. but it's going to cost and you know we've just got this thing and what are we and i'm not knocking them it's just the way the system works i think that happens in a lot of places as well yeah. like we've spent all this money on this other thing let's just reversion it for out of home it's not is it not being seen as the premium medium anymore and then mm. you know mm. i think that's a real shame yeah but i think because they can they do yeah but then like you say consequently the standards are rub well the lower and so perversely, there should be more great work because there's there more be places to show your work. stuff. Um, anyway, we probably can't fix it right here, right now. Um, but I, so let's get into a bit more of you and your um, history, Graham. Um, the one, the first thing I want to talk about, actually, what I asked you was about your first job. Um, and I know you've probably told this story quite a few times, uh, but one more for us, because I think our listeners would be really interested in about how you how you get into this industry and how you make your mark and become memorable. And then I read I read the story quite a few times. You, you were trying to get into CDP um, as a junior, but you couldn't. They, they wouldn't take you because they said you were too young. Is that right? Could yeah. you just expand? So we on? eventually, it was me and my, and my copywriter friend, um, Steve, Steve Limbrick, and um, we we thought we had a really good book because Dave Trot had, had sort of All right. helped out and um, um, we thought, yeah, it's, it's, it's looking probably in the best shape. And we had an interview at CDP. We went to see John O'Driscoll, who was the creative director, and um, we were very excited and he, you know, he looked at the book and he said, it's actually a very good book. He said, the trouble is, you know, we don't really take on students. Um, and he said, you know, the youngest team here, they've probably been in the business for, for six years. He said, but you know what you could do, guys, you could go to Saatchi's. They've just won this huge account and I um, can't remember what it was. And he said, so they're probably looking for people. Um, right. And as we walked towards the lift, he he said something about. Funny enough, we are look we are looking for a, a team, but we're looking for someone older, you know, m m a senior team, someone older, more experienced. Come back in twenty years, kind of joke. <laughs> and then we left, and we were walking up the up the street back to the Euston station. And I suddenly had this thought: Well, why don't we go back and get that job? So we dressed up as old men. We we wore these old, we went to the Oxfam shop and we bought these two sort of old raincoat Max <laughs> and, we, and a couple of walking sticks. And the next day we turned up and I went to Boots, the chemist, and tried to dye my hair white uh, with peroxide, but it didn't work. So we ended up buying a talc of uh, Johnson's baby talc, putting it on our hair and it in. And a bit of burnt cork around for a bit of stubble. And then um, I think one of us had a monocle. I had a pair of old specs. <laughs> And then we walked back in to Collix the next day and the receptionist thought, this is just hilarious. What, what on earth? So we tell them the story. Could you ring up John O'Driscoll and say, oh there's God. a senior team here to see you. Brilliant. And of course they, they did, you know, oh. and he's obviously thinking, what? <laughs> we'll send them up. And of course, when the lift door is open, he just looks at us and he goes, oh God. Brilliant. <laughs> Cracked Brilliant. up laughing. So. We then go to his office and other people are coming out. Hey, what's this? Who are these guys? Why are they dressed up like his old men? And and then the book started going around. And another creative director, Dave Brown, saw it and said, so what's the story, lads? And we said, well, you know, we're looking for a job. And he said, well, can you leave the book overnight? And we go, oh, this could be good. And we said, we've got an interview at JWT tomorrow at 10 o'clock. He said, well, pick the book up at nine. So we turn up the next day and his PA comes down. She said, um, he wants to see you. And we go up and he said... We'd like to offer you a job. Oh, wow. So I wow. thought from that moment, well, nothing is impossible. You know? yeah. And if yeah. someone says no, you know, don't take no for the answer. And um, and we do that in our work. So why not do it when you yeah. are looking for work? Yeah, so I, great. I remember reading, I mean, it's an absolutely inspiring story. It's so audacious. And I it echoes something you wrote a, a while ago as well about never before moments, which I loved. And I wonder whether, you know, like, things we think shit that's never been done before god i want to do something like that do you think that set the tone for you and your career when yeah you, definitely yeah and you went yeah. hold on let's just yeah. look at this slightly differently because that's that's pretty formative isn't it yeah i think you can always there's always creative ways around something that's why i think you know creativity should be at the heart of every business you know, yeah because yeah. It, you know if you're if it's not working this way then or that way then or another way then you know we can come up with a fourth yeah. way you know guys you know yeah this way. it's also kudos to them at cdp for going do you know what 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we want. Rather than going, oh, very funny. Anyway, yeah. get lost. But that's why it was like, you know, the best agency in the world. Yeah. I remember um, Trevor... Trevor Robinson and Al Young, when they were yeah. Al Henry, and Adam and I used to go around our book, and they said, you've got to do something really out there, man. Just do something really crazy. I've, I've told this story before. He said, um, just come back next week naked or something. And <laughs> put, we didn't. But he said he did it to a team, and they once turned up naked at reception, and they said it was just like a car crash because their book was still shit. <laughs> it's so, fine if you've got the work to back it up, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, you had the work and the, um, the idea. So, uh, um, so you've got... <laughs> Your feet under the table at, at CDP. Did you do your first billboard campaign when you were there? Yeah, yeah. So the first um, one I did actually was the uh, was bees for um, Benson and Hedges. Oh, mate, brilliant! That's just so oh, segued nicely there. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Hugh, Hugh's got his presentation together. And well, he's I mean, got it was it in great... the right order. It's perfect. <laughs> it was a great campaign, and it had just been I think a year or two before we joined, and Alan Wardy. Um, was responsible for for this amazing campaign, and you know the the, the cigarette laws. I mean, oh, you can't even advertise them now. But at the time, you know, they were still very strict. You know, you couldn't show wide open spaces and, and nature. You couldn't show green trees, and you couldn't mm. have people. You couldn't show people smoking. And um, and they had a health warning, which at the time I remember was like uh, I think it was twelve percent, then it went up to fifteen percent, then it was twenty one percent. But it, but because they couldn't say anything, Wardy hit upon this brilliant thing about well, let's do surrealism, mm -hmm. and I just remember at the time it was fantastic because you used to see these posters for Benson Hedges cigarettes, and and the pack was so iconic because it was gold, and it just had a reference of the pack in every poster. Yeah, because I was interested. Was that the brief? Just the pack and some gold. I don't even know if you have to show the pack because sometimes <laughs> yeah, because this one the pack have... is in. But sometimes it's yeah. I mean, it's it's represented, but it's not always as a pack. And I guess that that color being so iconic, it depends on hedges. Color being so iconic, and and everyone, I think you thought, what the hell is that? That looks great, and people yeah, had to try and work it out. So mm -hmm. what? it's kind of a bit of surrealism in there. What does it mean? And I think that's what caused such a buzz. How did you put together this bees one? Because for me, it's it's cinematic, it's beautiful, it's mysterious, it's surreal. It's, it's just got so much going on. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So this was my first ever poster and I and you know we were you know it was the 80s so there was lots of money we had lots of time and all the photography we used were world-class photographers right and this was taken by um a guy called Ed White who was you know flying high at, at the time I mean he was just amazing and um he hated any kind of post-production right um retouching all that stuff so the idea was I just wanted to see um, a couple of a, a swarm of bees, but the idea is when you look at them, it's not they're not bees. They're millions and millions of tiny Benson the Hedges packs because mm. they look like bees, mm. um, and they're and they all and the swarm goes into two beehives in the foreground. And Ed said, um, "What we're going to do? We're going to build a whole garden in my studio." This is in Greek Street in London, <laughs> yeah. and it took them two weeks, I think, to build the garden. And it was just like a miniature. And then he ha we had the beehives made um, by a model maker and they were lit inside with that kind of gold light. And then every single one of those packs was built in full perspective. So the smallest pack is literally like a half a half an inch what? big. And then wow. the biggest one is is full size. And so I think there's probably four or five hundred packs <coughs> there and every behind every single one um behind the camera kind of thing so you, you're looking at the pack but behind <coughs> that, that pack was a was a wire about um a foot in length and then it was stuck to a piece of glass uh, on it by a piece of, of of wood so you couldn't see it and that's that was true for every single one so when we went to expose it it was a really long exposure of about half an hour that's right. And Ed would just gently touch all the packs and they would all vibrate to give it that sense of movement. <laughs> and then when you look, and so we had this massive piece of glass or perspex, which must have been like sort of, what, 18 feet wide, 
about 12 feet high and it was on an angle. And then behind that, he had a, a projection screen and he projected. So that tree yeah. you see is a photograph he took in his garden at sunset and he back projected that, which right. gave it all the, the backlight. And then the foreground is all real the plants and stuff. And then we put, I think we hid weird things in the in the garden, just this little in jokes. And then the, the assistants went in with torches to light it as well. It, like I said, it was a oh, long, long half an exposure. exposure yeah. And then um, <coughs> for the packs in the foreground, that was on a different set on black. And so Ed was taking us on a 10-8. And after the sort of half an hour, hour exposure, he would take the slide out. He would take it to another set, put the slide in, expose six of the of the packs closest to camera and they had like a little bit of of gold behind them so it looked like a bit of movement and then he had the master pack on another set so he took the the sheet out dropped it in another one and photographed them wow. pack. so the Jeez. whole to do each one i think with to get an image uh, a piece of film of each one probably took about five hours so we probably did two a day Wow. And then he would look at them and say, do you know what? We could do better than this. We need a bit more light. So this went on and on and on and on. And I'm not joking. It took 16 weeks. To no do, way. Yeah. 16 <laughs> weeks to do the final thing. Oh, God. Love was it only running on billboards or was it running in press? It ran on press and billboards. Right. But I've got to say, I, this is why the series we've started this series, I didn't know. I actually thought you were going to go, I mean... It, I thought you could, it would be much more simple. Yeah, two shots, overlaid, bit of retouching. Yeah. <laughs> That's just well, blowing my and, mind. And here's, this is what we're going, what we're talking about at the start here is, you know, the, the effort that goes into this iconic piece. We're talking the planning before you even get to the studio and, and uh, two weeks of build, 16 weeks of shooting. <laughs> like, yeah. The idea, it's, I mean, the whole so, thing. So nuts. Because in those days, <sighs> Was there, it was a lot of model making, right? And cleverness in camera. But was there any, how much retouching was? There was no retouching at all on this wow. thing. That's because amazing. Ed was absolutely <laughs> determined. There's not even the tiniest little I was gonna tickle say. of something around the, around the final pack. It's just, oh, mate. Yeah, it's, it's never been it's near a retoucher. It's a, I feel like I need to do that. Um, oh, so good. And then this bloody great danger, middle tar, danger. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing is, in a funny sense, that health warning was like the headline because the minute you saw something that sort of had a gold sort of look right. and a health oh, warning underneath, the, you immediately knew that's for benzene yeah. hedges. Mm. Help, helped your time. You know what I mean? So it sort of helped. I mean, what a start. Jeez, we, um, we, we should move on to the next one. Um, and say honestly, say if there's more stories around some than others because I've got, I yeah. think there's six or seven. The next... Um, poster is of mannequins which are all naked and there's one which is the shape of the Benson Hedges pack and yeah. with a sort of uh, it's quite Dada-esque this one and yeah. so and every mannequin has a little number on it and there's 20 number 20 is ah, on the right. um, square thing so again another little clue it's mm -hmm. 20, 20 cigarettes and because the, the square mannequin is, is as you said naked there is a gold cloth in front of it and um, being sort of made up as if uh, it's from a from a tailor, and obviously that and that looks very Dali esque. Mm -hmm. Look at it, the way that that gold drape. And um, again, hangs. was that all done in camera? All yeah. done in camera. And what was? How did you make the the sort of sh shed? It's not skin really, but it's sort of like clothing. Was that just a little? Did did the photographer actually make a square? dress for the pack and then derobe it or i don't know i'm not sure if that no. if that cloth is actually you know square but it's yeah. uh yeah it's just a giant piece of like the silk the silk gold yeah. because it that's mm. the color of the pack and if you look really closely there's nice little details that you'll see like a bit of black cotton and red cotton because the red yeah for the logo so you, it is all those little you know semiotic codes in there to it's quite a weird 
thing, isn't it, to start here? Because this is, without sounding too much of an arse, uh, it's quite, this is like art, isn't it? And we're talking about artists. Uh, yeah. Your first gig yeah. would normally be going like, where's the benefit in this headline? You know, what's the <laughs> USP? Can it be Helvetica centered and a lo logo and maybe a t coupon? And yet you've started. It must have been quite weird. To well, start. I was very lucky because, you know, this campaign was going. And it's funny, I was talked to someone the other day about this. You know, why at college they had these long running campaigns and everybody knew the format and the public knew what they were like. So we had Hamlet cigars, for instance, mm. right? We had Heineken. Heineken refreshes the parts. Other beers cannot breach. It was always a before and after. You know, everyone knew the formula for the Benson Hedges posters. Everybody knew Hamlet cigar, you know, that mm. something happened and then that, yeah. you know, the bark music starts and happiness is a cigar called Hamlet. And so the creative team, every creative team, it was an open brief on all of the stuff. And so obviously all the art directors were desperate to get yeah. the next Benson Hedges. And there was another art director, Nigel Rose, and we were in fierce competition because Neil Godfrey was also doing these things. He, did, he didn't do so many, but Nigel was ferocious, you know, prolific, trying to get these things out. And he knew I was snapping his... I mean, I hadn't even been there. Like, <laughs> so I'm desperate to do these things. And there were two or three other art directors. So, you know, at the end of every two or three months, you know, it would be Neil Godfrey who would pick the the one to be made. Really? Because I think we only ran like six a year. There were only four Hamlet commercials that ran a year. Right. And everybody was in their spare time writing Hamlet scripts. Right. And right. if you got your script onto the short onto the short list and actually it was a long short list to mm. start with you just go oh, wow this is great and then if you got it into the shorter short list there were still like 10 of them and you know they're only going to make four yeah no wonder that this, the work was just brilliant yeah you know yeah it's that trotty thing about the hundred boxes yeah. and then ten and at each yeah. uh, each uh short listing is it is the idea being tuned again for the yeah, next short tune getting better yeah. getting better or you know or out yeah so can we move on to some more of these? Yeah, the pencil shaving. Pencil that was shaving. one of my favourites. I love um, this one, and it's because you know there is no pack. I was going to say no the devil's in the detail here, though, because yeah. with the with the, the the trim around the outside, the, trim, the logo. If you if you look at the edge of every pencil shaver, you can see that it must have been you know okay. shaved from a pack. So there's a gold pencil, the stub of a gold pencil left, the pencil sharpener, and then all of these. And again. Though, were those made so when we had a, um, I'm jumping the gun here but going yeah. to talk quickly about Silk Cut Ale Alexander Taylor uh, was in and she brought us uh, along she's fantastic phenomenal she brought the cotton the spool of cotton yeah from, so, amazing so I'm looking at this now and I'm thinking were those shavings enormous yes yes okay yeah. How big to were get they? the depth to, to get the depth of field because if they were too tiny we couldn't mm. have got that that great depth depth of field so they were um, they were probably like the size of a, of a normal f fan that people use. Right. Um, you know, really see the detail in the wood as well. It's and so when it <coughs> lays down, it probably like completely fill up a, a large table. And then the pencil shape, pencil sharpener was a was a big piece, probably really? two foot, two foot. So in those days, again, as an observation, not much retouching. You or the photographer would have to know brilliant model makers, right? And did you find that was more the onus on you or was it more as an art director or more on the photographer? Where, who had that It was a model making company. What, can you remember what they, they were? They were always like the best. Right. Asylum. I oh, think very good. Asylum. Very good. And it was kind of automatic that Asylum would make the, prop, the models yeah. because they were the best. Or occasionally we did use other, other people. Right. Um, but yeah, they were... Just incredible. Yeah, because it's, I love real stuff. You can feel it more, no matter how much people say, oh, retouching is great, blah, 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 nowadays. I don't know. There's there's something about these, there's, there feels that something incredibly, I don't know, strong and composite yeah. about but, these. Uh, and you get, you, well, you feel the craft of it. Yeah. Don't you? That's the, that's, yeah, it's really, really true. Sorry, right. go for yeah. it. We're just flicking through. So we're looking at maybe, well, should we move on? Which was the next one you'd like to talk about? So let's look, talk about this one, the, the wolves. So um, 
the idea is you've got these three or four wolves and they're looking up and they're howling at the moon, an eclipse of the moon. But actually, if you on closer inspection, it's not the moon. It's, it's uh, the Benson Hedges pack have been eclipsed. And again, I used Ed White, um, who, who did the, the bees. And Ed is again deciding that there's going to be no retouching. We're going to get this all in one shot. Obviously, we're going to have to strip in it strip in the pack mm. but um he was determined uh to get all these wolves looking up at the moon howling <laughs> and you know he did not want to shoot the wolves in a studio separately and strip them in this probably would have been quite sensible um we decided <laughs> we are going to go to um to the, uh, the park uh, a national park up in scotland which is where they look after these wolves in this in this huge massive massive um kind of area probably three miles um three so three or four sort of acres and we went up there for the day and we walked into the into the park with the wolves and they're running wild. and of course you know they're dangerous animals so we go in with like <laughs> gamekeepers and they've got rifle guns and and then we and it's great because we say okay there's a hill here this this hill in this park and it goes right the hill then runs down and there's a kind of a lake at the bottom so ed said we're going to shoot at the top of this thing he said what i'm going to do i'm going to put um two step ladders here um about um sort of 12 foot apart and we're going to hang a plank of wood across the top of these two step ladders and on this plank of wood we're going to hang these pieces of meat Right, and we're going to starve the wolves for <laughs> a couple of days. And the idea is... And that's the last time you ever saw Ed. <laughs> and then we are going to build our own oh, cage within this massive cage oh, where, the, where me and Ed and his assistant will be. And that's probably 20 <laughs> feet from, the, from these stepladders. And... They built another step ladder behind with all the with the light, the big big power, you know, the power packs to power the to power the big backlight. Right. And then we then we dug um, trenches about a foot deep, and we hid all the sink leads from the power packs into the main camera. I think he shot it again ten eight, uh, or, or it may it may have been five four, and and now we're in a, in this cage within the big cage. <laughs> And and so that sort of took like a couple of days to set up, and the rangers were kind of starving the wolves for a couple of days, oh and, my God. and and they're at the bottom by the lake, and they're not getting much f food. And then the, on the big night, we all go in into the cage, and um, we're desperately waiting for the wolves to come up, look up at the at the meat, and and uh, that's how we're going to get it. Well, the wolves are so terrified they didn't come up. <laughs> <laughs> and we waited all night till about five in the morning. And so we're like, we're in this cage for about seven hours and we were freezing cold because we're up in Scotland. So we drive back to the hotel and the next afternoon we come back and the wolves had dug up all the sink leads <laughs> oh, and God. they dragged one of the power packs down the hill and it was in the lake. <laughs> and obviously we take, we take the meat down at night and they'd knocked over all the step ladders. So we came back to... London to sort of lick our wounds and decided that's simply not going to work. Um, I think we had another go at it. I think we may have got one or two of the wolves kind of sn sniffing around, but they didn't really look up. No. So what we did, we ended up shooting it in a studio <laughs> with a wolf trainer that held a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> the wolf looked up and went, oh, snap. And we stripped them all in. <laughs> Ed must have been fuming. He must have been fuming, Ed. Right. He wanted to do it all in one. Yeah. Oh my God, that is brilliant. That's, that's on another but scale. But it did go up on the Cromwell Road, there. So my parents were very proud of me doing a, a, a poster. It was on the yeah. Cromwell Road. And we managed to park the car somewhere. And my and me and my mum and my dad and my brother, we walked back up Cromwell Road. And I think there's a picture of us, of me and my dad. I think we're kneeling down and we're howling oh, in, in front of the, in front of the, the poster. <laughs> I just love, that's one of the things I do love about our industry, the out of home industry, is that we, the, the work that we do is so highly visible that yeah. it becomes a destination for us as creatives because I, I love going out and seeing mm. my team's work and my work up on the yeah. wall and yeah. um, on billboards. It's, it's, it's pretty That's phenomenal. That I think, yeah. If we're going to move on to the very last one of oh, the snakeskin. Snakeskin. So, again, it's. Um, 
the snake skin, the snake sheds its skin and, and sort of goes off. And I, and I thought it'd be great to have a snake skin in the shape of a pack. Um, again, Asylum made that pack a large part out of um, what they did is they cut out tiny pieces of cellophane. Right hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. They sprayed them all gold and then they hand glued the, all of them together to create that kind of skin. Right. And I wanted Bruce Brown, the American photographer, to shoot it because Bruce took these amazing photographs of, he was really a car photographer. He shot, shot a lot of cars in the desert. Right. And I thought, I want to shoot it in the desert with with Bruce. Right, and he will know how to make it all just look because he he had this kind of pinky sort of light to his shots. And I went to see him at his house and he said, no, we shouldn't shoot, shoot this in the desert. He said, because what happens in the desert, you get this kind of the, the, the slight wind all the time. And he right. said, and it's imperceptible, but he said, but it will be blowing that, um, the, right. that, that pack away. Right. And he said, what we need to do is to shoot it here in a, in a, in a little sandbox in the yeah, corner. I said, what, we're not going to the desert? I want the trip. <laughs> yeah. Um, I took a lot of convincing. But he said, no, look, really. And he said, and I will get that beautiful pinky light. He said, because um, I've got this color temperature um, uh, meter, which I knew about light meters. I didn't know about color temperature meters. And he said, yeah, well, daylight is 5,000 degrees Kelvin. But whenever I shoot this, it's whatever it is. He said, there's a certain... I can't remember the degree Kelvin that right. he shoots in the desert, but he said, I will set that and I will make that, wow. you know, give it that desert light. And so he, he, we just built a, a, a little sandbox in the end. We put the, the sand in there and he, he, he created the path with, um, you know, those, those, um, tin foil things that scalpel blades come in. Oh yeah. Tiny. And he just created it with that and he put all the ridges in with that. And so actually it was very, Simple shoot, correct. <coughs> Just more more craftsmanship, but you know, on a different level. Did you when you did them? Because I was spot, so I spotted a scamp that you did of the Venus flytrap. When you went in to see your creative director, did you draw? We, you're quite a good yeah. art draw, drawer, for want yeah. of a better word. But did you always, you, you know, did your scamp look a little bit like this? Um, uh, yeah, no, it it did. Um, I used to love drawing these these things up. I used to spend a long time drawing it uh, with the with the Venus flytrap there. So I drew this picture and that, that Venus flytrap. It's it's grab it snaps the it's kind of missing the flies, but it snaps the, the pack. grabs the pack and there's a little drip coming out the pack. And Barney Edwards shot this. And Barney, I don't know if you ever worked with Barney. Um, you know, he's an uh, he's amazing, amazing photographer, amazing artist. Yeah. But he would do everything in the most difficult way, you know, and you know, it could never be simple. It all had to be a whole army had to be. Right. You know, and I said, look, we're going to shoot this Venus flytrap. And he said, well, we need to shoot it in a greenhouse. He said, we will build a greenhouse in the studio. He said, I think it should be lit by moonlight. And he said, and because, um, he said, I've got this open air part of the studio we will wait for the full moon and oh. we will get the, the real moonlight to light. <laughs> right. All right. Okay, Barney. Cheers. And then he built his whole greenhouse and then we've put, as again, I said we couldn't have nice green plants so everything had to look a bit sort of dark and mm. which I preferred. And then again, that, that Venus flytrap, you know, the real Venus flytraps are really, really tiny. Mm, yeah. So this again was made by um, Asylum. And I remember them casting the inner part of the <laughs> flytrap with cow tongue. They had cow's tongue in the thing, oh and they would God. put the resin into the cow's tongue, peel it off, and they they built that entire wow. um, plant, That's which amazing. again took like a couple of months. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And then Barney decided once it was all set up, Barney brought his air rifle in, and he he said every window, every greenhouse always has a broken window and he got his air rifle and he shot a couple of holes in the, in the thing and then but you can see it's got this kind of blue cast so that is yeah. all lit with um, with the moon with the moon oh, it's amazing because it's quite it's very atmospheric it is it's, yeah. beautiful so the snake skin one 
which we're still, which you've actually sent another version of two nights ago, which has some graffiti on, Graham. Yes. Could you, <laughs> it says, advertisers speak with forked tongue, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Any? So that was great. I mean, we spotted this. I can't remember whereabouts in London it was, but some graffiti artists had, had sprayed over the snakeskin thing. Yeah, advertisers speak with forked tongue. And uh, I thought, oh, this is just, this is just fantastic. You know, it's getting noticed. People are engaging yeah. with it, and um, okay, it might be a negative message, but actually, I think it's, it's, it's terrific. It's only one thing worse than being talked about. It's not. It's not being about. talked about yeah. exactly. What does it say beneath the pack? Do you know what that says there? I can't read it. And it's not a read word, is it? It's not a jealous art director from CDP. They didn't get their work through, so we're going to mess it. Probably Nigel ones. Rose. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> um, so uh, let's put let's put CDP to bed, and then we were going to we're going to go and talk about Silk uh, Sarchi's. But in between, there was a very brief spell at WCRS. So this isn't about billboards at all. But apparently, you did throw a yucca plant at uh, an account man. Is that true or not? Not quite, <laughs> not quite true. I did throw a yuck, but it, was, but it wasn't an account man. So uh. the story was, is, uh, you know, Jeremy and I went to WCRS and um, and I wanted Tony Kay to direct a commercial that we had just written for, um, I think it was for, for, for Castrol, for right. Castrol Oil. And Tony Kay at that time was still kind of struck. He still hadn't found his... It's brilliant. It was just before or just after he made the um, the British Rail uh, Relaxe yeah. thing, which was his big sort of breakthrough. Yeah. Um, and I was great friends with Tony because he was an art director at Collitz when I was there, and I thought he was fantastic. And I wanted him to 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 make this thing. And um, the head of TV, this guy called Simon Wells, uh, arranged a meeting for for Tony to come in. And um, Mark Antonio was uh, was the um, ECD or creative director. I think we only had creative directors yeah. in those days. Yeah, so, so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Jeremy and I went out uh, for lunch. It, it wasn't a, a long lunch. No. Um, when we came back from the meeting at like I don't know three o'clock or something, and um, and I walk into Simon Wells's office. And he said, we've cancelled. He said, I've had a chat with Mark and Tony's not the right man for this job and um, I've cancelled the meeting. Right, right. Well, of course, I just saw red, you know, because <laughs> when we were at Collins, you know, you just kind of said, the, and, and it always sort of happened. So, um, I, yeah, I just reacted really badly and there was a, there was a table, <laughs> there was a table in front of me with coffee and stuff on it. So I kicked it over. Right. And... Um, <laughs> and Simon go, what are you doing? I can't. And I said, no, 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 you know, you can't do this. Tony shooting the thing. And then there was a yucca plant, a massive yucca plant in a huge pot with all this kind of earth and gravel and stuff at the top. And I tried to pull this yucca plant out <laughs> and I couldn't quite get it out. Oh. I kept pulling, pulling, and then suddenly bah, up it comes and all the gravel flew all over the office. <laughs> And I sort of swirled it round, and I and I threw it across the room, and um, I think I knocked all the books off his desk. And um, it's like Excalibur taking the <laughs> sword out of the stone. And I went downstairs and resigned. Oh, right. And I okay. said, you know, I'm resigning. Right. Um, and uh, I left. I walked out. And that was your last day? And that was, that... was my last day. Mm. And, um, okay. and Jeremy, who didn't even know any of this was happening, he sort of comes up for the meeting later about to and sees all this earth and yucca plants and debris <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> What's and, going on? Um, and it's funny, the next day I was judging, um, I was sitting on the DNAD TV jury. Mm. Right? So I went to this, uh, to this, um, you know, do the judging and I'm sitting there with like the good and great of the industry and it's the first time I've been on the TV jury. I mean, and that was sort of like to get on the TV jury at DNAD was like amazing. And I'm sitting there judging away and someone says, how is it going at WCRS? And I didn't really know what I said. Yeah, yeah, fine. Like, oh. <laughs> anyway, at the break, someone came in and she said, is Graham Fink here? And I said, yes, it's me. She said, I've got Paul Arden on the phone. <laughs> and I, and I 
I mean, Paul, to me, was like God. I mean... He was at Saatchi's at he, time. Paul was at, at Saatchi's yeah. and I'd only met him like twice and I think I was so in awe of Paul. And I went to pick up the phone and uh, I said, hello, and, he, and it's Paul, because he has his slight study. Is that Graham? <laughs> um, yes, Paul. It, it is Paul Arden. Um, I want you to come and see me at my flat tonight in Cavity Square <laughs> and bring your copywriter. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I mean, <laughs> so we turned up that evening and um because we're all really sort of dressed up and i remember i had this sort of paul smith shirt on which was gray and white stripes with this sort of red roses on it and, yeah. and had and i wore these sort of metal braces and i had a very small jacket with a police badge on it and um and jeremy always used to wear the three-piece suit um and his wife, um, T Tony, a wonderful Dutch lady, opened up and she said, Paul, we'll see you. He's at, in the office at the end of the corridor. So we walked down this corridor. It's just absolutely beautiful. I remember seeing it's all like mahogany corridor wood and, right. uh, you know, it, it was just like everything had been art directed immaculately. Yeah, yeah. And we get into this office at the end and in the middle of this tiny office, Paul Arden is reclining on a red dentist chair, <laughs> smoking a cigar. He said, C come in. And we sit on this Chesterfield um, sofa, the two of us. And, um, and he said, thank you for coming. First of all, we should discuss money. <laughs> <laughs> and he leant forward and he took out this pen out of his pocket. And he went to his desk. His desk was absolutely beautiful, immaculate, you know, wooden desk with that mm. sort of big green yeah. sort of blotting paper pad on the top. And there was a big layout pad and he he covered up the, the what he was writing so we couldn't see. And he wrote something in the in the tiniest corner of this big <laughs> lay, layout pad. He, he wrote something and he ripped it off and he rolled it into a little ball and he threw it onto the floor. We... <laughs> <laughs> we opened this oh tiny God. bit of paper and it had a telephone number on it. Telephone. And, it, and we said, "We're coming." <laughs> Brilliant. Is that? And that was it. And that was it. So That's then like, we went to Sarchi's. So I think, yeah, that is where we should stop now. Absolutely, because we cannot rush. Silk car. We definitely can't rush the time at Sarchi's as well following Oh, that. my God. Right, I need, need to get my breath. Thank you so much. So the end of part one with you, Graham. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Um, we're going to be <laughs> following you. up with all of the rest of the amazing work and stories. That? Yeah, I know. Thank <laughs> right. you very much. We'll yeah. see you next time. Blimey, I'm still... <laughs> that's absolutely blown me away. That's a great, I... that's a great ending as well. Oh, every... <laughs> Every bit of it was mega. How do you get to Sarchi's? Well, you're scrambling around on the floor looking at the tiny piece of paper with with oh an excellent God. number on it. Yep, we're coming. The thing is, I, Paul Arden is a really like amazing, you know, legend. And yeah. Star, and I know that I can just imagine that whole thing. Oh, God, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. I mean, um, I don't know. Well, I'm, I can't wait for part two. I mean, everyone, I'm sure you've all listened to that with uh, like we like we've been talking on the edge of our seats. It's been brilliant to hear Graham stories. And so. he actually got off his seat and acted out, but Dan <laughs> very professionally tried to push the microphone towards him. Back to the mic. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's part one of Graham Fink. Don't forget to follow us on socials, and uh, and the next episode, part two of Graham Fink, will be out shortly. 